This is the lecture on section two of chapter six. We're going to look at the factors that influence the size of human population. There's a lot of vocabulary in this section, but a lot of it you've already heard if you were in class doing the visualization activity that we posted up on the board where we colored the five different regions. So you'll see that it'll be reemphasized here. Definitely definitions and lists are very important in this section. Okay, so first thing we're going to look at, though, is a little bit of a review. How do we know what the population is doing, if it's growing, if it's shrinking, or if it's remaining stable? So we're going to look at population change, and luckily for us, it's the same exact equation we had before. We need to worry about the people who are coming into the population and the people who are leaving. So we've got births and we've got deaths. Fertility for births, mortality for deaths. But remember, you can also come in and out of a population, same as we had in ecology. So the idea of populations remains the same. The idea of population change remains the same. You can have migration with an I, which is incoming, or with an E, which is exiting migration. Sometimes you'll see it just listed as migration, and it'll be positive or negative depending on if the people are coming in or leaving. But we're going to use the same population change equation we used from the previous unit. Births plus in migration minus deaths plus exiting migration. That tells us how much our population changes. Some terminology to remember, the crude birth rate, we discussed it in class as just birth rate, is the number of live births per 1,000 people in a given year, and the crude death rate is the number of deaths per 1,000 people in a given year. Obviously from the equation, if you've got more births than deaths, your population will be increasing, and if you have more deaths than births, your population will be decreasing. Here's a look at the 2008 and predicted 2025 numbers of population. Again, we did this in the bell ringer a few days back. And what I want you guys to, to realize is that the book is outdated, and that's why we like to bring up new population data numbers from 2012. But this is the year that your book was published, and, and so these are the figures that we have. But see where the growth is occurring. The United States will have small growth. Um, but China, India, very large growth. Indonesia, Pakistan, again, you've got substantial growth there as well. Look at Russia and Japan down at the bottom of our, of our list. These are in the, or were, in the world's 10 most populous countries. Um, but Russia and Japan, you can see, are shrinking, which, if you remember us looking at the list before, uh, we did not have Russia on our list. They are shrinking too much to be included anymore in the top 10. Okay, some more vocabulary terms, and again, we saw this in the activity. Fertility rate, the number of women, I'm sorry, the number of children born to a woman during her lifetime. And we typically, though, are talking about total fertility rate, TFR, which is going to be an average, um, because one woman doesn't make the whole country. Miss Duggar, 19, 20 kids, is not predictive of the rest of the United States population. So usually we use the average, but fertility rate is how many children a woman would have during her lifetime. The replacement level fertility is the number of children that a woman must have to replace themselves. It takes two people to make a child, so replacement level fertility. We always expect to be around two, but we find out that it's a little bit different. It's 2.1 in developed countries and closer to 2.5 in developing countries. The reason for this is that not all children are going to survive to reproductive age. So that has to be taken account of in our averages. Since the medicine and childcare is better in developed countries, you need closer to that number two of replacement level fertility. And since medical care, um, infant mortality rate, are not as good in the developing world, that number goes higher. So you're going to have the highest replacement level fertility in countries in Africa. You'll have the lowest in countries mostly in Western Europe. They tend to do better than we do with child rearing infant mortality rate. And again, I said that mostly what we're going to use is called TFR, the total fertility rate, average number of children born to women in a population during their reproductive years. In the United States, it's very close to two. 
In Africa, it's closer to four to five. And that is, again, an average. You might have some women who cannot have any children, and you might have some women who have plenty um, <laughs> to make that average go up even more. In the United States, our total fertility rate has dropped, um, and a lot of that can be accounted to the leveling off since the Industrial Revolution. We had the baby boom, and then we had the end of the baby boom. So there has been a drop in total fertility rate. Families are getting smaller. But the population is still growing. It's not leveling off. Our population has increased fourfold since 1900. And changes in lifestyle in the U.S. during the 20th century um, have presented a, a major part of this. Again, we talk about suburbanization. We talk about um, growing immigrant populations, immigrant with an I. And so our population here is based largely on that, our population growth. Because again, our fertility rate is dropping, um, but our immigration rate is not. So here's a look at total fertility rates for the United States between 1917, First World War, and 2008 when your book was published. And what you'll see is a dip, and that dip coincides very closely with the Great Depression. And we see a baby boom after the Second World War. And then we see that leveling off again, a decline again. We did have some economic issues in the 1970s. We came down below replacement level fertility in the 80s. That was characterized as the me generation. People weren't thinking about um, the future very much. And so we, we saw that as well in the 80s with our fertility. And then it started to climb slowly back up, but we're still right around replacement level fertility. So the United States should not necessarily be growing. Here's another expanded look at this. Um, we'll talk about demographic transition a little bit later. The things I really want to point out, again, you see depression here. We've got instead of TFR, births per thousand. So this is our birth rate instead of per woman. Uh, but we see that birth rates fell towards the depression. They increased and then increased substantially after the end of World War II. This was our baby boom. Then we had the baby bust. And then we have what's called the echo baby boom. Those are the children of the baby boomers. Some of you may be in that. Um, my parents were early, early baby boomers, so I'm in the very, very beginning of the echo baby boom myself. Okay, so again, in the United States, the TFR is decreasing. Generally, we've been going down since the baby boom. This is expected in demographic transition. We'll learn about that in another lecture. Why are we still growing? We get one person added every 11 seconds, but two-thirds of our growth is because there are more births than deaths. Yes, we're having fewer children, but fewer people are dying. And the amount that our life expectancy has increased outweighs that drop in the birth rate. But then a third of it is due to immigration with an I, both legal and illegal. This is a really interesting graphic, and I'm not going to take the time to read through everything, but I do suggest that you pause the screen and, and take a look at some of the really interesting changes that have occurred since 1907 to today, so the last 100 years about. Um, in 1907, three leading causes of death were pneumonia, tuberculosis, and diarrhea. 90% of doctors had no college education. I love this one down here. 30 people lived in Las Vegas. Women washed their hair once a month. Marijuana, heroin, morphine were available over the counter at the local drugstore, and 230 reported murders. So times have changed quite a bit. Um, I did read most of them, but there are a couple other interesting ones in there, um, just to show you again how times do change. Okay, so. Uh, looking at how life expectancy has changed, these are the numbers that are really important. Those were interesting. But life expectancy here has increased from 47 to 77. Married women working outside the home. High school graduates. Homes with flush toilets. Let's all be glad for that. Electricity. Living in the suburbs. Again, that happened right after the World War. World War II, that is. Hourly manufacturing job wage adjusted for inflation and homicides per, per 100,000 people. So again, we can see those drastic changes 
and um, I think we can agree that, that these are some good changes as well as washing your hair more than once a week. Okay, so what is it that's affecting fertility rates? In the United States, we're dropping, but we know that that's not the case everywhere, and not every country or region has come down to where we are in the United States. And some have gone even further, dropping their rates to, to negative numbers um, to, or below replacement level, which gives you negative growth, like in Europe. There are 10 main factors, and these are very important for you to know and to understand how they affect the total growth for a population. So the first one is the importance of children as part of the labor force. If you need children to work on your farm or to beg for you in the streets, then you are going to have more children. This increases fertility rate. The cost of raising and educating a child. Not everywhere do you get free education for your children. And if that is not the case, you might not have as many children. So if it is expensive to raise an educated child, that decreases your fertility rate. Public and private pension. Students are always confused about this word pension. Pension is retirement money. And so whether we're talking about private through your own company or public through the government, if you have pensions, you tend to have fewer children. And it works like this. If there is no money provided for you when you retire, you better have a good kid to take after you, to look after you like you did, uh, to look after your child when, when they were young and, and um, unable to care for themselves. So we see in a lot of cultures that there is no pension system, but the young are expected to care for the old. So if there is no pension, you have more children so that somebody can take care of you. Urbanization. You move to the city, you don't have those farming jobs, you tend to have fewer children. So moving to the city decreases the need for child labor, generally, which is going to decrease your fertility rate. Educational and employment opportunities for women, this is the strongest link that we see. The more educated a woman becomes, the less likely she is to have a lot of children. She starts to take ownership for her own body, for her own choices, for the money in the family, which gives her power. Education increases, fertility rate decreases. Number six, your infant mortality rate. We talked about this with Africa. If you have a lot of children dying before age one, then you will have a higher fertility rate to replace those children. Fertility rate is how many kids are born to you. Doesn't matter if they live or die. So if you expect that some of your children will die, you will have more children so your family size ends up where you want it. Average age of a woman at the birth of her first child. This one is pretty obvious too. The sooner you start, the more you're going to have. Women who put off having their first child until age 30 or further are only going to have two to three kids. If you start having children at age 19 or 20, it's potential for having a lot more children. Availability of legal abortions. This one confuses students because we are talking about fertility rates, which mean you have to be born. So if abortions are legal, fewer children are born. Okay, so make sure that you realize how that one works. If abortions are legal, it decreases your fertility rate. Some people say, well, but they're going to get pregnant more. Well, that doesn't matter in these terms. Fertility rate. Okay, so you're not going to have the baby if you were able to have the abortion. So availability of legal abortions lowers total fertility rate. Availability of reliable birth control methods. Again, if you don't get pregnant, you're not going to have the baby. So this decreases your fertility rate. But Number 10, some things override that, like your religious beliefs, traditions, and cultural norms. And so if that's the case, if your religion doesn't believe in birth control, that's going to increase your fertility rate. But maybe your cultural norms say or mandate fewer children, like in China. And so then you would have, again, a lower fertility rate. So 10 is a very tough one to associate with an increase or decrease in TFR because what really matters is what exact tradition and belief are we talking about. That's almost 15 minutes, and so I'm going to pause right there. Um, there's a little bit left to section two, but we'll cover it up in another lecture.